Hi, and welcome to today's session. I'm Josh Frame. I'm a national chair of the Federal Youth Network. And uh, today you are joining us uh, for uh, the session on uh, competencies, attributes, oh my. So this is uh, part of the FIN virtual learning series, um, hashtag FYN virtual. If you uh, follow that um, on Twitter, you can get any updates in terms of the learning series. Um, but uh, very excited to, uh, to be here for today's session. Um, and I'll begin by acknowledging that uh, I'm uh, coming to you from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. The Algonquin peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial, and I encourage all of you to acknowledge um, the land that you're on. I see we have participants joining us from across Canada, um, and uh, we'll put the link in the chat if you're, if you're curious about uh, the land that you're on or, or unaware of, of what uh, traditional territory you occupy um, across Canada, uh, you can find it at that link. Au fur et à mesure que nous progressons dans la session d'aujourd'hui, uh, veuillez partager vos questions en utilisant le bouton uh, questions et réponses, uh, c'est uh, nommé Q et A, uh, dans la langue de votre choix. Uh, vous pouvez voter pour les questions que vous voulez poser en cliquant sur le bouton uh, thumbs up, uh, malgré le, le bouton thumbs up n'est pas bilingue. So uh, as we go through today's session, um, please put your questions in the Q&A function, um, and uh, we'll be uh, posing those at the, the end of the session. Um, to our panelists, uh, Alex uh, and Morel. So, um, so today with us, as I said, we have uh, Morel Andrews and Alex Saka, um, and each of them has a presentation. Um, as we go through the presentation, um, we'll, uh, we'll do the presentations primarily in English, uh, but I'll, I'll cue in um, for some summaries of the findings um, in French. Um, I'll, I'll note as well that today's session is being recorded and will be shared later on the FYN YouTube channel. Um, and on that YouTube channel, you'll find the recordings of all past sessions um, as well. Um, so before we begin, um, I'll go to each of our panelists to share a bit about their journey and how they came to be uh, a part of the public service. Uh, so Alex, we'll, uh, we'll start off with you. So I'll be talking a little bit about this uh, throughout my presentation, but basically I've only worked for the federal government for about four years, uh, but I've been working in the HR innovation space and future of work since my early days at Nortel. And if you want the full career uh, story of me, it's on LinkedIn, but the, you know, the traditional trajectory of life being, you know, a diagonal line moving upwards, mine's more of like a messy ball of chaos uh, at times. So I'm hoping that, you know, some of my experiences, observations and research can resonate with some of you. Awesome, thanks very much, Alex. Uh, when, when anyone says they used to work at Nortel, I, I realize that now we almost have to give a disclaimer of like, Nortel used to be a big company in Canada. Um, and uh, you, you know, you might, uh, it was the equivalent of like Shopify is right now, except, you know, back, you know, sort of 15 years ago. Um, but uh, no, thanks very much for joining us, Alex. Um, and Morel, over to you for, uh, for introductory remarks. And thanks again for, for joining us today. Merci. Hi, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Um, my name is Morel Andrews. I'm currently a policy advisor at Global Affairs Canada. I have been in and out of the public service since 2015. I was a student and then I was a casual and now I am a term. Um, and so I've done every single type of contract and we'll be looking to help break down the basics of our hiring process because I think it's so important. Um, I used to be in Ottawa, but now I live in Vancouver because of COVID and telework and this is where I love. So um, for anyone who's out on the West Coast, let me know, DM me on Twitter. Let's meet up. Awesome, uh, thanks very much, Morel. Um, alors, on va commencer avec uh, la présentation de Morel, et puis uh, après ça, on va aller à la, la présentation de Alex. Um, so we'll start off with uh, Morel's presentation, and as I said, we'll um, every couple slides we'll uh, do a, a French summary of that discussion. Um, as mentioned before, please share any questions you have using the Q&A function. Upvote those questions using the, the thumbs up uh, function. Um, and if you have comments to share, uh, please feel free to share those um, in the chat. I see we have uh, 200 uh, people attending uh, with us today from across Canada. So I'm very excited to have you engage in this discussion as we go through it. Um, over to you, Mara. Okay, just give me one second. It will load, hopefully. Okay, here we go. So transferable skills, decoding the HR and hiring process 
in the public service. So to start off today, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the traditional ancestral and unceded land of the Squamish, Salwatooth, and Musqueam people in what is known today as the West End of downtown Vancouver. Um, I also want to acknowledge that as young people and public servants, we have a particularly important role to play in reconciliation. And I hope that you can take time after this session to reflect on number 57 of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and realize a bit more how it applies to you as a public servant and how the topics that we discussed today have incredibly important implications, not only for Indigenous peoples in what is known as Canada um, and their access to employment opportunities in the federal public service, but also the employment opportunities of other marginalized groups that have been systemically excluded from employment, um, in particular, those um, in our communities who are Black, disabled, and newcomers. I also want to preface this, preface this by saying that um, I am in, by no means a human resources professional. My personal experience does not represent that of every single person um, who has been hired through the public service, but I come from a department where knowledge of the HR system means survival. And as I mentioned, I've been almost every single type of contract except for indeterminate and have qualified um, through processes. So because I believe in transparent hiring and a better, more inclusive public service, I'm really happy to share all this information. Um, and to help take down some of those systemic barriers um, and systems of oppression that might limit people's abilities to access some really, really interesting jobs. I'll make everything public. Um, so we'll, we'll share the slides after so you don't have to take um, very copious notes. Um, everything will be, will be provided to you after this presentation. Okay, so first, the very, very basic you're probably here today because you'd like to find a job in the public service. And the first thing that I recommend everyone do is get online and create a job on jobs.gc.ca. You should become very familiar with this platform. It is the central place to find most jobs in the public service. Um, it will tell you all the information you need to know about a job in the job advertisement, also known as a poster. And it will also tell you almost everything you need to know to be successful in a hiring process, also known as a competition. So through jobs.gc.ca, you'll be able to view every single job that's been posted. So for example, today there are 739 jobs that are open to the public that have been posted. Um, but you don't have to look at all those jobs. There's, that's a lot. You can also filter um, by the specifics that you're looking for based on location, the type of job, the organization, classification, linguistic profile, salary, and many, many other things. And depending on the type of contract that you might be on currently in the public service, or if you're not employed by the public service at this time, you won't be able to see every single job that might be posted on jobs.gc.ca. I mentioned that there are over 700 jobs currently out there um, for the public, which are also referred to as external jobs. Um, but there's also 361 jobs for those who are already employed in the public service that are posted today. And these are known as internal jobs. And I'll talk more about those in a little bit. But when you're on jobs.gc.ca, um, you may also find that there are certain departments that hire more than others, and that can give you a really good indication of the places where you might have a higher chance of getting through a formal hiring process. For example, if you look on jobs.gc.ca today, you'll see that the Employment and Social Development Canada, um, also known as ESDC, which is one of the biggest departments, currently has 31 jobs posted that are open to the public, Whereas the Privy Council Office, also known as PCO, has zero jobs open to the public. So jobs.gc.ca is your best friend. Um, but you don't have to go back and check the website every single day to go and wait for the, your perfect job and the perfect department that you'd like to work for. Um, you can make it easier for yourself and set up daily email notifications based on the preferences and the filters that I mentioned before. So once you've made an account on the website, you can go in and enable the option to receive a daily email that summarizes every single new job that has been posted that follows that criteria that you're looking for, whether it's salary, the classification, the department, whatever. 
Um, and it will actually just make your job a little bit e easier because it automates the system and takes, you know, removes the need to go back and check every single day what has been posted. Jobs.gc.ca is not the only place to find a job, however, and because the public service is inherently imperfect, not every job opening that is, you know, available will necessarily be advertised here. Um, some competitions will also draw thousands of applicants and may take multiple years, like yes, years, sometimes two years to complete, but you don't have time for that. You want a job now. So you should be complementing your daily email subscription that I just talked about with some research and other places that will help you. Places like Facebook, believe it or not, there are so many groups where jobs are advertised. Um, some of the big ones include, and I'll put this in the chat, don't worry. Um, some, of the, some of the big ones include uh, GC policy, informal slash unofficial. There's one called GOC jobs for students, recent grads, entry level and mid-career. There's one called GCHR, unofficial, informal. And there are many, many more. There are so many jobs that get posted um, in these Facebook groups and also in closed groups, which is a bit disappointing because it means that we're not having open processes that everyone has access to, which I personally think negatively affects employment equity, but that's just my perspective. Um, but now you know about them and you can, you know, have this other resource to access job postings. Um, if there are other groups that you know about, feel free to put them in the chat right now, because I think today's conversation is all about, you know, opening up some of the, you know, some of the secrets to hiring, decoding, and it's in the spirit of collaboration and making things easier for everyone, um, which is why we're here. You can also look at Twitter. I find it a really effective tool personally for networking in the public service. Um, and if you're already an internal employee, you can look at resources like GC Connect, the career marketplace on GC Collab, um, and even your intranet for more options. I could talk about this literally forever <laughs> um, and how our process works, but I will pause here for Josh and his uh, very quick um, translation, and then we'll move on to some of the basic terminology that's important for you to know. Certainement. Um, alors, Ma Marielle a discuté de que le site Emploi GC, c'est vraiment la première ressource. C'est la première place pour trouver uh, les emplois qui sont postés d'une façon uh, formelle par les départements. Um, c'est une place de créer un compte, c'est une place de créer uh, un, uh, les notifications des uh, postes qui viennent um, à chaque jour. Alors, maintenant, il y a 700 ou plus uh, uh, emplois uh, pour uh, le GC à l'extérieur. Alors, uh, si tu n'es pas dans le gouvernement, tu peux uh, s'appliquer à ces postes. Uh, mais si tu es interne dans le gouvernement, tu peux appliquer à ces postes aussi. Uh, mais aussi, il y a l'option pour les postes internes. Um, et puis, uh, Morel a discuté de uh, les autres sites. Alors, les sites uh, comme uh, Facebook qui ont les, uh, les groupes uh, informels pour trouver les emplois. Alors, c'est Uh, si tu veux chercher um, un emploi uh, qui est peut-être, uh, ce n'est pas comme un emploi à, à long terme ou de façon permanente nécessairement, mais peut-être c'est uh, d'avoir un, un uh, emploi à court terme um, et il y a des uh, groupes différents um, comme GC Policy et puis uh, les autres uh, GC Communication. Um, et tu peux trouver tous ces groupes sur, uh, sur Facebook et puis je pense que Jen a, a mis les liens Um, dans uh, les, les fonctions chat. Back to you, Mara. Merci beaucoup. Okay, so next is some really key terms that you should know. The first one is jobs open to the public. And these are terms that you'll see, you'll come across on jobs.gc.ca in an advertisement, also known as a poster for a job. So jobs open to the public, pretty self-explanatory. Jobs that are broadly open to people residing in Canada and Canadian citizens residing abroad. And it's important to note that the Public Service Employment Act was recently amended. And now um, those who are permanent residents of Canada um, are also um, eligible now for certain types of jobs um, that are open to the public in ways that were not previously available. 
Um, so I won't get into the PSEA, that's a whole other thing, but you should definitely read more about that and let managers know because some managers still actually don't know about this really important change. And if you are a PR here in Canada, um, you should have access to opportunities just as much as anyone else does based on this change. Um, a next, the other, a next term that I'll talk about is internal jobs. So this one's also pretty self-explanatory. These are jobs that are open to candidates who are already employees of the public service. In most cases, this means term or indeterminate employees, um, but it can be further restricted to employees of a certain department or geographic area, for example. Um, and there's a lot of value in, in becoming an internal employee because this status opens up a world of opportunities for jobs within the public service that you might not have access to otherwise. Um, and sometimes it makes sense for certain people to say, I'll take the first job the first internal job in the public service that I can to gain access um, to the whole of the public service and then move around from there. The next two definitions, um, notification of consideration, also known as a NOC or a notification of appointment or proposal of appointment, also known as a NAPA, are not super important, but you might see this when you go into jobs.gca.ca to search for opportunities. They're just the types of notifications um, that are available to help make hiring in the public service more transparent when it comes to certain types of jobs. Um, but I won't dwell on that one much longer. Um, the next two terms uh, are non-advertised appointment and advertised appointment. So these are two types, there are two types of appointment processes through the public service once you're already an employee. Um, and the, the types of appointments can be informed by the type of process or the method that you gain a job or have been qualified through. So a non-advertised appointment is when a manager does not have to advertise a job, op a job opening. Um, they can simply decide to staff someone without running a formal competition on jobs.gc.ca. And almost all of the jobs that you'll find outside of jobs.gc.ca, like on Facebook, will fall under this category. The next type is an advertised appointment. Um, which is obviously the opposite of a non-advertised appointment. It's when a manager does solicit applications from a broad group of people based on the necessary criteria for the job. And almost all jobs you find on jobs.gc.ca will fall under this category. Um, the last kind of terminology that I think is important for everyone to know is the type of contract that you might be looking at. Not every job is created the same. And I think it's really important for people to understand what they're applying to. And you should know the different types of the contracts. So um, one example is FSWEP. It stands for Federal Student Work Experience Program, which provides full-time secondary school, CEGEP, college, technical institute, and university students access to jobs offered um, by the public service in the federal government. Students are hired through a central public service inventory of applications um, that is part of a process that's year round. So if you wanna learn more about that, just Google FSWEP, it'll come up. The next is co-op. Cooperative education provides full-time students who are registered in a post-secondary co-op or internship program with jobs in the federal public service. These jobs are advertised through the institution directly, but Sometimes you'll just find them on Twitter or Facebook. So if you're a co-op student and you're waiting for the federal government to advertise a job and maybe you're not located um, in the national capital region or in the Toronto Montreal corridor, um, you don't have to wait for an advertisement to come to you. There are ways that you can get around those, those, um, those systems. And so if you find something on Facebook or Twitter, you're also able to apply to those as long as you're registered in a co-op program. The next type of contract is a casual. So a casual worker is hired to meet a short-term, unforeseen and urgent operational need in an organization. This type of appointment, as a result, is exempt from merit, including language testing. So you'll never, you won't really find um, postings for casuals on jobs.gc.ca. These ones are typically pretty informal. Um, a big rule is that you cannot exceed 90 working days in the same department or agency in a calendar year. So for example, if I work a casual contract at Health Canada in 2021, I have to wait until 2022. 
to work at Health Canada again on a casual contract. But if I were to go somewhere else, for example, if I were to go to public safety in 2021, that's fine, no problem. You're not represented by a union, you don't have access to paid vacations, sick days, or the public service health care plan unless you work over six months for the public service health care plan. Um, and you're not an internal employee. That's a really important distinction. The next type is a term. Term employees are technically meant to only fill temporary requirements, but in practice, they're often used outside of that scope. Term contracts can be various lengths. They can be three months, they could be two years. And this type of appointment is subject to um, merit, including second language evaluation. Terms are represented by a union. You have paid sick days, you have paid vacation, you have access to the public service health care plan. Um, and as a term employee, you're also subject to something called the three-year clock. And so in the public service, there is a rule that says that if you work um, for three whole years at the same department without a break in service, being 60 days, a break in service, if you work three whole years, same department as a term employee, you are entitled to be regularized or made indeterminate in your position. Um, so this means that you work three years, you've done a great job, you're still here, we'll make you permanent, and you don't have to worry about contracts anymore. <laughs> What a dream, um, because this doesn't apply in certain circumstances. For example, for myself, if you work on a temporarily funded program, also known as a sun sunset funded program, you don't have a clock to indeterminacy. And you should also know that if there is a workforce adjustment, if there is financial issues with the department, that departments can actually suspend the three-year clock to indeterminacy. For example, my department, Global Affairs Canada, has done this twice in the last 10 years. So you should know. Obviously, indeterminate employees are permanent. They have all the rights associated with work in the public service. So this is all the basic of what you should know when applying to, uh, to a process in the public service of Canada. And so I'll pause here for Josh to do his thing. Oui, certainement. Alors, euh, certainement, dans le, le gouvernement du Canada, on a beaucoup de types de contrats différents. Um, commencer avec uh, les, les contrats d'étudiants, les coops, uh, les occasionnels um, et les périodes uh, déterminées, et puis les, uh, les contrats indéterminés, les, les contrats permanents uh, comme une employée. Um, alors, uh, c'est important de, uh, de savoir uh, tous ces types de contrats et les, les différences entre eux. Um, certainement pour les uh, contrats occasionnels, ce sont les plus compliqué d'une façon um, avec uh, les périodes de travail de seulement 90 jours um, et puis uh, les, les limites de travailler pour un département pour 90 jours et non um, uh, dans un, uh, un calendrier. Um, et puis uh, pour les périodes déterminées, um, il y a les, les différences comme maman l'a mentionné en anglais um, avec, uh, avec les, les, uh, les temps que vous pouvez uh, travailler d'une uh, façon déterminée, puis changer à uh, une uh, façon uh, ou un contrat indéterminé uh, après trois ans. Mais c'est uh, différent, um, comme Amara l'a mentionné. Um, S'il y a des, des changements dans le département, des limites uh, financières et tout ça. Um, et puis sur uh, l'autre diapo, on a uh, examiné les, les, différentes, uh, les différents termes. Um, et puis, toute cette information, ça va être uh, fourni uh, dans les présentations après les, les séances. Uh, mais uh, certainement, l'information importante quand il uh, s'implique uh, au uh, gouvernement du Canada pour savoir les, les différentes uh, actions, les uh, notifications, et puis uh, pourquoi est-ce que c'est important et pourquoi est-ce que tu peux utiliser cette information um, comme, uh, comme une candidate pour uh, savoir les, les raisons que quelqu'un a été choisi et, et non à uh, trois, ou peut-être pour um, un uh, type de travail que uh, une personne a été choisie avec cette expérience, cette connaissance. À toi, Maren. Thank you. All right, so now we're getting into the meat of it. This part is super important. If there's one thing you take away from this conversation today, I hope that it is this. It's about competencies, it's about skills, it's about attributes. So, a critical part of hiring in the public service and where many people go wrong, um, one, because there isn't a lot of information that's publicly accessible, but also because it's a bit confusing, is what's known as the competency-based approach. So hiring processes in theory are based entirely on merit and the vast majority of evaluations as a result 
have to use rubrics and a standardized way of, of grading applicants, um, including in particular in your interview. And so a competency is known as any observable and measurable knowledge, skill, attribute, behavior that contributes to successful job performance and is part and central of what we do when it comes to hiring processes in the government. So a competency can be, can be behavioral, they can be technical, but every job has a different mix of competencies required to do the job. And these competencies make up what is known as a statement of merit criteria. You might also hear people refer to this as a SOM C. And knowing the competencies and how to demonstrate that you possess them, it's absolutely vital to be successful in a hiring process. Each one has a definition as well as keywords that will help you rack up the points in a hiring process, including an interview. So as I've said, I'm not an HR professional. So when I talk about competencies, I mean that it's everything in the section of a job poster that says, in order to be considered, your application must clearly explain how you meet the following essential, essential qualifications and the part that says the following will be assessed or applied at a later date essential for the job. So this section of a job poster will talk about your experience, the language profile, but also the competencies you need to demonstrate for the job. You might see this under subtitles that um, include knowledge, which will most likely be assessed in an exam, competencies, which are often assessed in an interview or a reference check, um, experience, which is normally evaluated in the screening questions where you have to be super, super explicit and clear about how you meet the requirements. Um, they might be referred to as abilities, which are typically assessed in an, in, a, in, an, in an exam or an interview or a reference check. And then there's also personal suitability, which is often checked in a reference. Um, some of the common competencies you might come across in a job poster or advertisement on Facebook include things like judgment, client focus, initiative, interpersonal understanding, adaptability, conflict management, influence, developing others, and honestly, my personal favorite one <laughs> is thinking things through. I don't know who came up with that one, but I just find it so funny. Um, but these are the things that help, that will help you pass a process. And I want to break this down more because of how important it is. If you fail one competency in a hiring process, whether it's on jobs.gc.ca or elsewhere, you will most likely fail the process altogether. So let's take the example of adaptability. Okay, so this competency is, it's a pretty common one. It's defined in this particular rubric as adjusting own behaviors to work effectively and efficiently in light of new information, changing situations and or different environments. And so you'll see that there are five different levels to this competency to gauge how sophisticated you are able to demonstrate that you possess it. And each level of the scale We'll start with a statement in bold and you'll see behavioral indicators and bullets underneath to help you better understand what each level in the scale is about. So level one is usually associated um, with more passive and lower level roles, whereas the, the levels up to five, you know, obviously it's incremental, are more associated with active and are more active um, behaviors and are more associated with higher level positions. So when you're doing an interview, what I would suggest is try to hit the highest level in all cases of the competency. So to prepare for an interview, one, you're gonna to wanna to know what the competency is, what it means as a definition and the different levels that are associated with it. Um, when you prepare for an interview, I recommend that you know, obviously all of this off by heart. And I find it particularly helpful to look at each behavioral indicator and underline the key word that I need to remember that I need to weave into the answers in my interview or my written you know, exam, if it's applicable. So if I know I'm being tested, for example, on adaptability, in an in before my interview, I would go through this competency and I would highlight the keywords. So under level one, I'm like accepts, seeks clarification, tries new approaches, suspends judgment, acknowledges, adapts personal approach, seeks guidance, variety, shifts, improving opportunities, composure, anticipates, blah, blah, blah. So what I do is I actually like take the keyword of the behavioral indicator and then I write one keyword that I have to like memorize and remember and know that that's something that I have to reference in an interview 
Because if you do that, then you're going to be able to have the interviewers tick that off on the rubric. Um, and you're going to be able to get more points when it comes to the interview. Um, in this case, the competency dictionary is your best friend. And every single department kind of has a different competency dictionary. Some of them are publicly available. Some of them are not. You might be able to find a bootleg version online. Um, but you can also just do a Google search and find the definition of a word. It's normally pretty similar and almost build out your own table, like the one that I showed you, to help you prepare. And so my biggest advice when you're you know, sitting in a competency-based interview is to one, obviously know the competencies you're being tested on, have real life examples prepared in advance that speak to how you've been able to demonstrate these in the workplace. You should consult the dictionary and know the keywords and you should structure all of your responses very, very clearly. Structure is everything. So you should, you've probably heard this before, but you should always answer a question using the format star situation, task, action, result, and relevance. Tie it back to the job that you're applying for. One of the greatest resources that you can look at is a blog. It's called Polywog's HR Guide to Succeeding in Federal Government Competitions, um, which I tell everyone to look at. It is literally what helped me pass my EC5 interview the first time I tried. Um, and you can also look at the Canada Public Service subreddit because it also has a lot of great um, resources. But you're here today, and so sometimes it's hard to find these dictionaries, so I wanna share them with you. So um, I'm at GAC, so I have access to our competency dictionaries and most of, the co most of the definitions that I need to know in interviews, but you might not have that. You might be external to the public service. So on this slide, you will find a comprehensive list of all of the open source public competency dictionaries that go through and define all the words you need to know and prepare for an interview um, these are the ones I've been able to find over the years. And I cannot stress enough how important it is to review these dictionaries. If you can't find a definition, again, Google it, make your own definition, make up your own behavioral indicators, but know going into an interview exactly what you have to speak to and how to best demonstrate that you have that competency. If you do this, it will help you so much and you will probably be way more successful in a competition if you had not done this. So I will pause here. I have a few more slides, but I will let Josh share the translation. Oui, ça demain. Um, alors, pour les compétences, uh, quand on, comme on voit sur l'écran, il y a beaucoup de définitions différentes um, entre les départements. Um, pour uh, le département de défense, uh, disons, c'est complètement différent peut-être uh, de l'Agence du revenu du Canada. Uh, mais c'est assez, uh, il y a beaucoup de similarités entre les deux. Um, alors, on peut voir uh, les, les définitions um, de ces compétences uh, dans ces guides. Um, pour uh, beaucoup d'emplois, ils ont les liens à les guides um, dans l'emploi. Um, alors, pour l'ARC, disons, um, s'il y a un poste qui dit que tu dois avoir ces compétences, ils vont mettre les définitions de ces compétences. Uh, dans, le, uh, dans le poster ou dans um, ou un lien à, à le dictionnaire des compétences. Um, mais certainement, il y a des différences entre les départements et puis um, ces guides sont, sont idéales pour, pour voir les compétences, pour voir comme uh, pour une position à un, à un plus haut niveau, uh, c'est quoi uh, la le, uh, définition de les compétences, disons, comme un niveau 3 ou un niveau 4, um, au lieu de Uh, le compétence uh, juste de base pour cette, uh, cette compétence. Um, et puis, uh, on a quelques questions uh, dans le chat. Je vais juste comme mentionner um, parce qu'on a beaucoup et puis uh, je pense que notre, uh, uh, nos participants sont, sont très engagés. So we have uh, quite a number of questions um, in the chat. I'll just bring up uh, a couple of quick points and Morel, feel free to chime in. But um, we have a, a few questions around pools. What's the likelihood of getting a job from a pool? Uh, what uh, some some basic questions kind of around um, you know what uh, what does it mean to get into a pool? Um, so really, uh, a pool is you know that process that you apply to. It may lead to a, the creation of a pool, or it may lead to the staffing of an individual. Um, but we're we're gonna pop into that on the next slide. So that's uh, that's perfect timing, Morel. Um, so we'll we'll hold off on those questions um, until you can um, present them here. Um, and uh, then we'll we'll pop back into some of the other questions a little bit later on. Hello, uh, uh, back to you, uh, Muriel. 
Okay, so I'm running out of time, but I'm glad someone asked about a pool because that's where we're going next. Um, so a pool is essentially, a, it's a really important concept for people to be aware of and understand, um, especially because we don't run a lot of competitions all the time and there are a lot of jobs, again, that are not posted. Um, pools are important because they help a hiring manager pre-qualify you at a certain level for a specific type of job. Think policy analyst, economist, admin assistant, paralegal, whatever, um, and can be used by managers to pull you out and hire you. So when a competition is run, there may only be one candidate selected for a job. That's fine, you don't care because a pool might be created through that process, which lets you pre-qualify, get on a list, and then shop around for jobs that are very, very similar because you've already been evaluated on the necessary competencies. You've demonstrated them. It doesn't have to be redone by another manager. And then you're placed in this pool um, that can then be used to pull you out. And so really, really quickly, there's two types of pools. There's a partially qualified pool and a fully qualified pool. The definition is here. I will skip this because I'm gonna give you the slides afterwards, but it's important to understand these distinctions. And when you are taken out of a pool, it means that you found a job advertisement or a similar job that can be used um, where the job that you've pre-qualified in can be used to staff you in another job. Um, so typically, if you're in a partially qualified pool, it means that there are still a few competencies that you have to be evaluated on. It's way less arduous for a manager to do, so it's pretty, pretty easy. But once you've pre-qualified at your desired level, um, you can essentially be put into another job. You're fully qualified. The manager doesn't need additional justification to staff you because you've already been evaluated. So it's so much easier for them to hire you. Um, and you can use this qualification to leverage and improve your substantive level in your current organization. Um, I don't have enough time to talk about it, but I'm going to share these slides um, and some of the resources that will tell you a bit more. But one thing I want to let you know is that you should only be applying to jobs to qualify in pools that are open for the entire public service. You'll see on this slide, the first option shows you for a closed pool that can only be used to staff certain jobs in a specific area of a department. Don't waste your time. You want jobs that are open to the whole public service. You wanna look at the intent of the process and it'll show you that you can be, you, you can use the pool to be hired throughout the federal public service in similar jobs. That's super important. Um, student bridging, there's a slide on it. You can look at it. Essentially, there's no rule. Every department does this differently. That's what you should know. Um, and you should protect your peace. Check the public service employee survey to know where you might be walking into. Not every department, not every section of a department is perfect. We know that work environments are not equally experienced by everyone. And you can look at the public service employee survey to understand a little bit more about the culture and know that these processes are super subjective. Sometimes it's not about you, it's about the government of Canada. I have failed things like intercultural proficiency, even though I lived in four different countries and work with like 50 different countries on my daily job. Sometimes processes are canceled. So the more you apply, the more options that you have. Don't limit yourself to certain things or certain departments. Know that you have pools, know that you have options. And hopefully this presentation in this deck will help you. So I will wrap up there. Um, sorry, I ran out of time, but if there's an opportunity for me to come back and tell you more about this, I would be very, very happy to. Um, but I will pass it off to the next wonderful panelist, Alex. Awesome, thanks very much, Morel. Um, so yeah, we'll switch over to Alex. Uh, just pour uh, Marcini uh, de façon assez vite. Cette présentation va être en ligne sur le site JC Wiki, um, et puis en anglais et en français. Um, et, et certainement cette information c'est uh, vraiment uh, uh, inspirant et uh, c'est très bon de savoir tous ces termes et tous ces uh, tous ces connaissances par rapport à les processus de sélection. Alors merci beaucoup Morel. Et puis uh, Alex, à toi. Uh, Alex, over to you. Hi, thanks. So that was an excellent uh, presentation, Morel. Thanks. And I think it complements what I'm going to talk about really nicely because there's no real overlap. And as you mentioned, you can do this in tandem. With one plus one, je suis sûr que je veux t'avoir. One plus one, toutes les coordonnées de mon cœur sont données, de l'amour sont données. Okay, sorry. Sorry about that. Alex. Sorry about that. That was my fault. Sorry. That's okay. 
So um, I see that the the uh, the presentation has a bit of a, um, it's moved around a bit, but so we'll just go to the next slide. So I hope to have some uh, fun with this presentation and uh, thank you very much for having me because I love talking about skills and thinking creatively on alternatives to the traditional way of hiring, which has never really worked for me since that one time when I was 19 before mainstream social media, I answered an ad in the paper because that's what we used to do to look for jobs. Uh, so while I went to school, I got this job that I answered the ad in the paper and that was awesome, but that's the only time it's worked for me. So First, I just want to talk about the assumptions and expectations and the pressures uh, that we're exposed to in our life because we're comparing ourselves to other people through social media, our parents and family, or comparing yourself to friends and colleagues. And the, my point of bringing this up is first that you need to shed these thoughts to really crack the code to you and to your skills and attributes, uh, to what inspires you and what skills that you have that you want to pursue and grow. So next slide, please. So just the life stages that have been redefined. Uh, this is from McCrind a McCrindle infographic. And if you haven't seen them, go check them out because they're super interesting. And it's just, you know, it was childhood, teenager, adulthood, and that was it. And now, um, you know, as I said, my career path has been a, a chaotic ball. Well, you know, it's childhood, teen, teenager, young adult, kipper. So a kipper is a kid's in parents' pockets, eroding retirement savings adulthood, career changer can come at any time. And then hopefully hopefully we all make it to uh, the down ager stage. Um, but things have changed. And so next slide, the traditional approaches have, as I said, have not really worked for me. So the idea of a dream job is really fluid and there's no right or wrong path uh, at any fork in the road. And as Wayne Gretzky uh, have, may have said in hockey, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, but that uh, has not applied uh, to me when I'm submitting my resume. So submitting hundreds of res resumes has not increased my chances for interviews or getting a job. Um, so I'm glad Morel touched on how to navigate the government hiring process and how to crack some algorithms to get your resume seen. Uh, I can't help do that because I have no idea how it works. And even with following the advice of changing keywords, taking the job description, putting it in my resume or cover letter to crack the algorithm, it only frustrated me and uh, made me feel inadequate. So next slide, please. So for any Harry Potter fans, you might be able to relate to this image. I feel like I'm throwing my resume into the goblet of fire and trying to fool it into giving me an opportunity for a spot in the tri wizard tournament. So, and when I say fool it, I really believe that I am the right candidate. I have the skills and attributes or at least one of the right candidates, but how do I get the goblet of fire to recognize this? So next slide, it's not that I failed or I'm failing. I had to start to look at it from the lens of fit. Is this a good fit? Like what energizes me? What depletes me? How do I find where I fit in? And looking at this from a Venn diagram perspective, I, I have to recognize my skills, my attributes, and my interests and see uh, the small space. What fits in, the, my, where do I fit in? So next slide. I started with uh, the Human Resource Business Intelligent uh, pro uh, Project. And it was, you're more than your job description. So I'm not gonna to spend too much time describing this project uh, because it's ongoing and very interesting. So if anybody wants to hear more about it, uh, you can contact me. But uh, we had a skill, created a skills inventory. It was developed and the pilot was between the Canada School of Public Service and StatsCan. And as that progressed, I had the opportunity to look at my own skills and learning interests and see how important this was. And to realize that I was more than just my job description and the skills that people had that were coming in through our survey were amazing. Uh, skills that managers wouldn't know about. They, uh, they would only know about the skills pertaining to that job description and not to the actual person. So managers are starting to see um, employees as people with skills and not just as you know, what's in their sample. Next slide, please. So I discovered uh, that this is what a lot of organizations and board thinking managers are doing. They're looking at skill sets of their teams where they are now, where they want to be, what skills they want to add or build with their, in their team and the gaps to be filled. Uh, so this is an example of our output from Power BI. And uh, we had individual dashboards. So we had a survey that asked what your top 15 skills were, what your proficiency was in those skills, and then 
uh, what your top five learning interests were. And we matched this with HR data from PeopleSoft. And so we were able to get a lot of good aggregate data for managers and organizations to see where they were, any gaps. But you know, what was in it for me was this great dashboard that I could use as kind of a condensed version of who I was. So next slide, please. So this is kind of a pared down example of my dashboard because uh, we did have accreditations, experience non-government, and, and as I said, the HR data from PeopleSoft. So this, but this is basically what I was interested in, uh, displaying my skills and my skills of interest. Next slide, please. So skills is only part of the equation. Um, I didn't mention this at the start, but I should have. So I'm one of Canada's free agents and uh, I'm not a spokesperson for Canada's free agents, but I'm happy to talk about the program and my experiences. I've included a link for info and uh, there is a recruiting campaign that is coming up sometime soon. So if you are interested, you can follow them on Twitter, LinkedIn or GC Collab to, to be notified. So to become one of Canada's free agents, I, I believe that you uh, have to be an interim employee. But what this did for me is after looking at my skills and learning interests, I focused on attributes. And uh, to be one of Canada's free agents, you are assessed on 14 attributes and they're all uh, listed there if you want to take a look or if you want to go to the wiki page and look there. So Canada's free agents is a talent mobility program and the free agent has the autonomy to choose projects based on fit and interest, which was really interesting to me. So um, the recruiting process was launched. I uh, just I showed how I met the 14 attributes in the application. There was individual interview, group interview, and then the selections were made. Next slide, please. Et uh, je vais juste interrompre uh, pour uh, un peu de français, mais juste uh, pour ce programme des agents libres. Um, certainement, toutes les informations sont sur le site, uh, sur le site Wiki um, des, des agents libres et uh, le recrutement, ça commence um, dans, uh, je pense, cette semaine ou la semaine prochaine. Uh, mais, mais certainement, c'est un programme um, assez innovateur pour uh, trouver les, les personnes qui ont les compétences pour être les agents libres, pour travailler sur un projet et puis um, sur un autre. Et, uh, et puis de travailler peut-être uh, sur un projet à chaque trois mois ou um, quelque chose plus long terme. Mais certainement, c'est assez innovateur, c'est un programme uh, intéressant. Um, on ne va pas avoir les, les questions sur le QR uh, sur ce programme parce que c'est tout sur le site Wiki. Um, so back to you, uh, Alex. Thanks, Josh, for jumping in. And sorry, I'm trying to go real fast because I want to make sure that there's time. I know people probably have a lot of questions. Um, so yeah, just feel free to interrupt me if uh, you want to jump in again. So um, for the attributes, uh, I had to think long and hard for examples on how I met each attribute. Um, it I thought if I didn't get into the Canada's free agents, that at least it was a really good reflection because I had done my skills and interests and reflect on that. It was good to... Uh, think about my attributes. So it was kind of a, a deeper dive than other things uh, when you look back on your experiences, when you have to give an example for each attribute, like even the one, even times when you thought you were in real tough or you failed or you didn't know how you're going to get through uh, situations, uh, how you handled those situations and your reactions, all of these experiences contributed to my attributes. So if something happens again that is similar, I might not react the same way because I've been through it before. So next slide. So I had a good grasp, but I needed to refine and uh, look how to convey this to hiring managers. So I used a couple of tools and I just put two examples here. Uh, if anybody wants to try them, there's a, uh, there'll be a, there's a link in there. So Plum, it's an artificial intelligence talent assessment tool. So uh, there, the link there is one that I used at the Canada School of Public Service had a really good uh, segment on Plum and they introduced this and they gave us this link to try it out. So I'm sharing that with you here. And it was a 25 minute quiz to assess, you know, where my skills were and uh, what energizes you and what drains you. And I was so excited after the presentation that I saw from the data community at CSPS uh, that I went right and I, I did this quiz. And then, I, because I think the idea of it is amazing to have a talent assessment tool uh, and artificial intelligence I'm really interested in. And I was really disappointed with the results. 
and it took me a couple of days to kind of reflect on it. And I thought I did it in the afternoon. I was kind of tired. I was in a bit of a rush. I had to drive my daughter to her hockey practice. So I got a coffee uh, in the morning when it worked best. I sat down and I took it, uh, the, the tool again. I signed up with a different email address because it is free and uh, it much better reflection. So just if you're going to do this, make sure you're in a really good spot with, with you know, a lot of energy and time to really think about the questions because you want the results to really reflect you. The second tool I've used is the EMSI resume optimizer. So I would Google that if you're interested in um, what I did is I copy and pasted my resume in and it um, automates, spits out uh, some, some of your skills, which was really interesting because things that you may have said or that you may have done, you not you might not be able to articulate exactly, you know, uh, the buzzword for that. So that helped me with, the, uh, with that. So next slide. Et euh, je vais euh, juste interrompre euh, pour, pour parler juste un peu de ces deux outils. Alors, c'est um, certainement utile pour, pour voir ces deux. Um, je, vais, euh, je vais chercher euh, les deux après le, les séances. Um, mais euh, merci pour protéger ces outils. Et puis, euh, certainement intéressant pour tous euh, nos apprenants um, pour, pour voir leur évaluation. Um, so, definitely, uh, definitely interesting tools that you're, you're sharing, Alex. So, thanks very much for, for sharing those. Um, and I'm sure our, our participants can benefit by doing those self-assessments. So uh, from uh, from these uh, these things, I developed a snapshot because I found when I was talking to managers or with, when I found projects that were interesting, or if I had a coffee chat with somebody uh, who had some opportunities, I didn't want to send them my entire resume. I find that people, uh, you know, I know there's some ADMs that don't want more than a page or that won't don't want to go into these things right away. So I went and I did just a snapshot because. I wanted to show them areas where I thrive, areas where I want to work, my skills, you know, and, and then I, I included the attributes that I have been pre-screened for as a free agent. So kind of like a wet your whistle kind of thing, snapshot. And then I have a link to my CV if they want some more detail or, some, or contact me if they want more detail. So that's my snapshot. Next slide, please. And then I had the grasp of the skills at his interest um, at, as a point in time. And so I wanted to identify places that I wanted to work. So I actively seek out interesting projects and I'll go through a list of uh, where I look at for these in a moment. But first I wanna to touch on leadership styles. That's okay, next slide, but thanks. <laughs> and why I look not only at interesting places to work, but great teams to work for, culture fit and leadership style has a big impact on your work. So I've had wonderful leaders and teams, and I've also had some real a-holes for leaders, to be honest. So there have been times in my career where I've been pretty low, and I'm like, is this it? Like, is this my life? Is this life? And I like the work, or I like the team, but wow. So now some people will say managers come and go, and leadership comes and go, but it's a trade-off. Like, how much of your life do you want to spend with a person like this? So now every time this happens, a few times, I have reevaluated, re and either adapted or made a change. So now things still happen. I still meet these a-hole leaders occasionally, but I don't internalize it now and think, is this it? Is this my life? Because I realize I have autonomy over my career, and I realize that this is a space where I grow the most and you know they have given me examples of my attributes like courage humility resilience perseverance so in a way they have helped me uh, become a free agent and be able to have autonomy over my career so this is the best example of what uh, what and where I don't want to work so just to give you another a positive example, I had been following this particular leader on uh, social media, went to talks, presentations, really thought this is a person I want to work for. Great leadership style, fit me. So when an opportunity came up, I jumped in a call with him and about seven or eight others interested in hearing about the opportunities he had available. So we went around and we introduced ourselves and gave a brief description of our skills. And it came to this one person who said, I'm so interested in this. I researched it on my free time. I live and breathe it. I love to talk about it. And I really want to work in this area. And he pretty much offered her a job on the spot. And this is what he wanted to hear. Someone that was passionate about it, 
wanting to work there, not someone who was just going through emotions of finding a job and would work anywhere. So we spend a lot of time talking about ourselves and why we should be chosen. And, you know, we also have to spend some time looking at fit and why we want to work at a certain place and kind of convey that passion. So next slide. So where do I look for, for interesting projects? So, I mean, everybody on this uh, presentation is already uh, doing great things. FYN is amazing. They have uh, incredible speakers and tips and topics. So thing, also things like GC tools, so GC Collab, joining groups. I I found a lot of projects from joining groups like Etienne La Liberté has a group and he has amazing uh, contacts and presentations and articles and uh, other groups on there. CFPF, Canada School of Public Service, the events and the data community, super interesting speakers. And the Innovate On Demand podcast has very interesting speakers and also coffee chats like so over the last three years being in government, this was one thing that was recommended to me right from the start is to reach out to people and say, hey, uh, you don't know me, but I'm interested in your team. I'm interested in what you do. I'm interested in drones. Uh, would you have time for a chat? And so like only one time over the last three years have I not received a response from somebody. Everyone has always agreed to meet with me uh, for a coffee chat. And that's huge. Uh, uh, a huge thing in, in finding a job, I think, is that personal relationship. Josh, do you want to jump in or, or should I go on to my last? Oh, go, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, next slide. So lastly, my equation has evolved. And while it may look complicated because there are so many factors involved to finding a good fit, is actually simplified things for me because now I know what goes into a good fit for me. It's simpler because I know the variables. So my skills, attributes, and competencies, plus the, the project that I'm interested in, their leadership, their culture, their project details. And you know, a big part of it is over work-life balance and career aspirations and learning interests. So last slide, what I wanna leave you with, uh, what I wanna leave you with is don't box yourself in looking for a dream job and be curious and be adaptable and recognize and even welcome the interactions with the harder situations you might find them in because you'll think, aha, thank you for identifying yourself and adding to my attribute examples. And always think about what awe inspires you. Thanks, that's all. Awesome, thank you very much, Alex. Et, et merci beaucoup pour cette présentation. Je pense que uh, votre expérience, c'est vraiment intéressant pour voir les différents outils, les différents programmes qui sont là pour uh, pour voir comme quelle est votre, uh, quelle est votre uh, position uh, que tu veux avoir dans le, le fonction publique et comment est-ce que tu peux avoir uh, cette position, comment est-ce que tu peux avoir le, le connaissance de uh, voir vos compétences et um, quelles sont les, les positions qui sont um, intéressantes avec ces compétences. So thanks very much for, for sharing all of your insights. Um, so we are getting to the end of our, our time, um, but um, if we have a few minutes uh, to, uh, to do a, a couple of quick uh, Q&As uh, with you, Alex, and, and Morel uh, with you as well, um, we would love to do that. I see we had a ton of questions in the chat. Um, and Morel and Jen, thank you very much for, for answering a lot of these questions. Um, but I see we had a lot of questions around, uh, around pools, um, around uh, you know, how, to, uh, how to find those positions. Um, I saw some questions around like, what is the chance of getting out of a pool? I mean, that's a little bit of a, um, it could be a little bit of a lottery, honestly, if there's a pool of 10,000 people um, and there's one job, well, you can, you can bet that your, your uh, odds of getting out of that pool are somewhere in the realm of one to 10,000, depending on whether you're the best candidate or the uh, least qualified candidate in that pool. Um, but uh, I see a lot of those questions have been answered. Um, the session is being recorded and will be shared on our YouTube channel afterwards. Um, but uh, Morel, why don't we go over to you for um, maybe some quick insights from um, sort of some of the questions that we're seeing in the comments that we're seeing in the chat. Okay, I'm glad we could come back to this because because pools are so, so important. And I've just, I've dumped a bunch of my answer in the Q&A section, but there was a question about um, what it means to get into a pool and why everyone tells you to apply to a bunch of them. So I kind of mentioned this a bit, but basically like, when you're applying for a competition, the process may or may not be used to make a pool of qualified candidates. It will tell you this in the job poster on jobs.gc.ca. 
And to essentially like maximize the effort and the work that you put in, you should be looking for intents of the process that are used to create a pool that can be used to staff similar jobs with, throughout the public service of Canada. Um, and so essentially it, it's important because it pre-qualifies you, which then essentially you have like the certificate that you can go to any other department, any other manager and say, listen, I'm pre-qualified as a policy analyst at the EC5 level. So you can give me a job and you don't have to go through and interview and test and do an exam and do a reference check. This is all done. Um, and so it just speeds up the process. Um, and like in some cases you may be partially qualified, which means that you have been tested on certain competencies that are mentioned in the poster, but not all of them. But in other cases, you may have gone through the whole entire process. You're just not the one person that was selected for that job. And so in that case, you're fully qualified. There is literally nothing else that has to be done. Maybe there's going to be a second language testing in some cases. In that case, you're still partially qualified. But if you already have your language, you're a fully qualified candidate. And it just speeds up the process. Um, you'll see when you go onto those Facebook groups that there are people who will specifically say, Hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm really interested in working in this field and I have pre-qualified in this pool. They'll share the actual like process number so that a manager can then go back to their HR department and say, listen, I found this person, they're pre-qualified. We know that they, like, they've met this standard and the merit criteria, very similar to the job that we have. And so I would like to go forward and hire them. And so it just makes the process so much easier um, and for you as a candidate is way more effective because it opens up all these possibilities. You don't have to go through another process and go through years and years and years or months and months and months of a competition. You have this piece of paper and you say, I get to skip the line and someone can pull you out of that pool. Um, it's important to know not all pools will last forever. Sometimes they last two years, sometimes it lasts forever. You're going to have to check with the HR contact on the poster to confirm. Um, and not all pools are transferable. Again, it says it on the slide. It shows you an example of what you want to look for for a pool that can be staffed across um, to you to staff positions that are similar across the public service. But my long form answer is in the Q&A on Zoom. Awesome. Thanks, Morel. Um, and I see we have some questions around inventories as well. Inventories are being used quite a bit um, in, in government, and oftentimes those are uh, really almost like a, a pre pre qualified <laughs> pool in that oftentimes there's very little if anything done it's just really an inventory of candidates who can be evaluated further. Uh, yeah, for I, I personally, uh, I, an inventory has never done anything for me I just ignore them personally, I don't think they're worth it, some people might. Um, but yeah it's essentially saying like yeah i'm interested in this here's my resume and maybe they'll look at you maybe they won't i've never had anything come out of it and it's annoying because you have to like renew your interest it's essentially like an expression of interest um but it's very very different from a pool yeah absolutely um and it, inventories i think are more useful on the internal side than they are on the external side so if you're um you know already at that level it's really an inventory of you know if there's an upcoming process where they need somebody at that level who's already there and usually it's more of a short term, uh, like uh, a six month position or, or something like that. Um, Alex, in seeing um, all the all the comments in the chat, I think uh, as expected, uh, lots of those are how do I become a free agent? What is a free agent? Um, and I'll, I'll again point everyone to the, the site uh, for that and to uh, look at when that uh, that process will come out uh, this fall for the next recruitment of Canada's free agents. And I'll set up for the program des agents libres. Veuillez voir les sites uh, pour toutes les informations, tous les QA uh, et puis um, met. Uh, in terms of your in terms of your presentation, in terms of what you've seen, um, comments in the chat, questions. Uh, do you have any um, any thoughts you would want to share as we uh, as we sort of wrap today's session? Yeah, just again, like take all this information and just like we're all different learners, like see what works for you because there is a lot of information out there. See where you want to spend your energies and uh, yeah, and you know, always uh, keep learning and uh, be adaptable. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so I think uh, we should probably wrap. Unfortunately, we could probably keep the session going for, for another hour, I think. Um, so, so certainly that points to that uh, we should have you both back um, as speakers, um, either for another virtual learning series chat or, or uh, chat uh, during, uh, during career bootcamp. Um, but definitely this has been very informative. As mentioned, we'll be posting the resources on the wiki site. And Morel, thank you for sharing out um, immediately the link to your presentation, because I think 
Um, definitely, there's a lot of interest in both of the presentations that you shared um, and the resources that you shared. Um, so, uh, otherwise, I will thank you both for, for your time. Uh, alors, merci à Alex Saka et puis à Morel Andrews pour uh, partager votre connaissance, uh, votre expérience aujourd'hui, um, pour uh, engager avec les participants. So, thanks very much for, for sharing your experience, sharing your presentations, sharing your knowledge. Um, and engaging with our participants uh, today. Um, and uh, we'll definitely look for any opportunity to have you both back uh, for a, uh, a more in-depth discussion on some of these topics that we've, uh, that we've touched on today. Um, but uh, as uh, mentioned throughout the session, the recording will be uh, shared uh, following uh, today's webcast. Um, and that will, link will be posted uh, both on our YouTube channel as well as um, on the FYN GC Wiki site. Um, for any of our upcoming sessions, so we have sessions that will happen next week on the 16th, on the 23rd, and then on the uh, 30th for the VIN Virtual Learning Series. So you can um, check out the links again for registration on the, uh, on the GC Wiki site, um, as well as in January when we host uh, the Government of Canada's largest virtual conference, which is uh, the uh, Career Bootcamp 2022. Uh, and Back to Basics is really our theme there, looking at you know, some of these topics in greater depth. Um, around um, selection processes, around career development, um, and uh, you'll be joined by thousands of other public servants from across Canada for that conference. Um, so uh, definitely look into that and registration has just launched for Career Bootcamp. Alors, on espère de vous voir uh, pour les prochaines séances uh, pour uh, novembre et puis pour le camp de carrière en janvier. Uh, mais merci beaucoup à Alex, merci beaucoup à Morel uh, pour partager votre connaissance, partager votre expérience. Um, et puis à tous nos apprenants pour nous joindre aujourd'hui uh, de partout au Canada. So thanks very much to all of our participants as well for joining us today uh, for today's session. Um, and we'll definitely look for any opportunity to, uh, to expand on this discussion in a future session. Mais merci à tous et puis bonne journée uh, à tout le monde. So thanks very much and uh, happy, uh, happy Tuesday, I guess, to everyone. Um, but have a great day, everyone. And thanks again uh, for joining us today. Merci. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye.